Hello, everyone. This is Margaret Manning with 60 and Me. This is the place where women over 60 come to be inspired. And over the decades, we've gained a lot of wisdom and we've learned a lot of things. But one thing we don't know very much about is our brain. So my guest this evening is Dr. John Medina. He is a brain uh, scientist. He is on the research, he's on our research board for the Seattle Pacific University and on the faculty at the University of Washington in Seattle, United States. So um, he is passionate about brains and he's going to help us unravel some of the mysteries and shatter some myths. So welcome, Mr. Medina. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. It is so wonderful to have you here. We have so many questions for you. And um, I guess my very first question for you is why are you so passionate about the brain? Well, my research interests are the genetics of psychiatric disorders. So I spend a long time thinking about how a brain develops in the womb. And then what happens when things screw up and years later you get a psychiatric disorder? Mm -hmm. I am profoundly interested in the distance between a gene and what goes on in the cell and what goes on in the mind and in the heart. I think about it all the time, Margaret. I, (laughs) I think about it when I'm in the shower. I think about it when I wake up. I'm thinking about it now. I can't believe I get paid to do it, you know, and it's been almost 30 years since I've been on this journey, and I'm still just as fascinated with it as I was when I started. Well, I love your energy. It's fantastic, and it is. It's an amazing topic, and I know that you've written a best-selling book called Brain Rules, where you actually lay out the 12 rules that, um, that outline the facts that we do know about brains and, you know, and shatter some myths. But I'd like to start with the myths. And uh, if you could share with us some of the misconceptions that we have about the brain. Sure. In fact, the whole reason to write the book was actually a reactive posture. Uh I'm sitting there on an airplane reading an article which says you can, with brain science, tell if somebody's going to vote the Republican ticket or the Democratic ticket. And (laughs) as I went through the article, I started looking at it and going, what? What are these guys smoking? You can't do that with modern brain science. And I threw the article across the aisle of the plane in the days when you could do that and not hit anyone. (laughs) When I'm told my wife, and my wife said, you know, you could throw stones at these mythologies all you like. And there's reasons to throw it. For example, you may have heard that you only use 10% of your brain. Have you heard that before? Uh, Yes, I've heard that. Yeah, you can take and throw that out. That is a complete (laughs) mythology. Resting state, eh, probably 60 to 70%. You may have heard that there is a left brain personality and a right brain personality. Have you heard that before? You mean there's not? Yeah, you can take and throw that out. You need both (laughs) hemispheres to make a freaking personality, okay? You got to have them. You may have heard that men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I heard that in a book. (laughs) Yeah, that's true, actually. (laughs) And it's not true. (laughs) I always question that one, actually, myself. (laughs) Well, my wife, then I told my wife that. And she said, well, John, you know, you really can throw stones at this if you like and stay in your ivory tower. And I love living there. I don't deal with the real world as far as I know, Margaret. Or you can perhaps have a more positive tone and say, well, what do we know about how the brain works that could be of practical significance? And I had in my mind two audiences when I was writing it. One was a group of educators. The other was a group of business professionals who might really want to know what we really know, anchored deeply in the peer-reviewed oxygen of good research, exactly what we know. So I said, well, we know 12 things that would make terrific research projects of a practical nature if the world of education and business ever got to get together with the world of the brain scientist, and we did experiments together. So that was the genesis of the rule, and you're absolutely right. I tried to stay as much as I could to the practical side of what we really knew. You know, and this is fascinating because I have reviewed the 12 and I think that they're all absolutely insightful and brilliant. The book is fantastic. But um, I wanted to ask you, because our community, 60 and Me, is primarily women over 60. So I wanted you to respond and give me your thoughts on, of those 12 rules, what would say the three be that you think are most uh, relevant to a, a person over 60, not necessarily a woman, and yep. uh, you know, give us some thoughts about how we can address them. So uh, which sure. are three? Let's go through three. The, the first one would be exercise, I would think. Okay. The second one would be stress. And the third one, I'm just going to say, is memory. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's another I'm question. I'm not quite 60, <laughs> but I'm getting there. And it's nice to be talking to you from Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's go through them together. Okay. The first brain okay. rule of, is exercise. Right. And, and the brain rule is simple. Exercise boosts brain power and buffers against the negative effects of stress. 
That you can say. You can take that home to the bank. So we should probably unpack that a little bit because, interestingly enough, the research that I'm about to cite actually comes from geriatric literature more for a 75-year-old than for mm. a 60-year-old, but still in the, in the population that are not pre-puberty. So here's what we know. We know that if you exercise 150 minutes of aerobic exercise in a seven-day period, you can boost sometimes substantially a cognitive gadget we call executive function. Okay. I should probably explain executive. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds like something from the business world, but tell me what executive function is. Well, it probably has that component to it, although it is a true cognitive neuroscience okay. term. Executive fu function has two large gadgets in it. One of them is your ability to take a look at variables that are completely surrounding you and organize them into some type of heuristic, which is what we call it, in such fashion that you can actually make sense of it. So it's the mm -hmm. ability to take lots of input and organize you it organize, fairly. Okay. If you've got good executive function, you're often really good at math. If you've got good executive function, you're really good at handling lots of things being thrown at you all at once and being able to produce an order. Okay? Mm -hmm. The second gadget in executive function land is emotional regulation and impulse control. Mm -hmm. Executive function keeps you from punching your husband in the nose the ninth time he doesn't do the dishes. Executive function is your ability to understand as a mother and as a grandmother that, you know, sometimes people just need to grow up a little bit and maybe I don't necessarily need to get so mad and so stressed about it. Right. So executive function has these two giant pillars. One okay. is a cognitive pillar. The other is an emotional pillar. And what I'm here to say is that aerobic exercise from the peer-reviewed literature can boost executive function anywhere from 20% to 60%, depending upon the study that you're reading. So my first brain rule is the first demographic suggestion for this conversation. If you are not getting off your butt and exercising, now is the time to stop doing mm -hmm. that. You don't need much. You don't even, you have to do moderate aerobic exercise for 150 minutes in a seven day period. Moderate is simply walking too fast to sing. <laughs> okay, we can so, all do that. We yes, can all do so that. the first practical rule is yeah, that it's really if good, you really want to stop punching people in the nose, and if you want to get better at math, for heaven's sakes, go for a walk. Okay, so exercise is number one. So that's, and actually, I think that's really, you know, very um, logical that, you know, whatever is good for your body is actually going to be good for your brain. So I think that that's, a, that's really great advice. And, you know, it's so funny. We say it so many times, but I think you're just saying do it. Just do yeah. it. Yeah. Well, from an evolutionary perspective, we were probably walking in our Ethiopian uterus in the Serengeti probably 20 kilometers a day. Back and forth over and over again. So we were walking all the time. And this magnificent problem-solving machine of ours evolved under conditions of near constant motion. You know, it's sometimes funny. I'll sometimes talk to an education audience and I'll say to them, uh, uh, they'll say, Dr. Medina, how do we improve the American education system? Because we're behind everywhere. <laughs> the, uh, 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 um, and I will say to them, well, if you wanted to design a learning system that was directly opposed to what the brain is naturally good at doing, you would design our system where you force these little ones to sit in a chair. Those little ones are built to go probably more than 20 kilometers a day. You and I could probably still do 20 kilometers a day, but if you created a system, what if you installed treadmills instead of a desk? So the practical suggestion for your audience would be this. If you can't get out and walk all the time, why don't you put a treadmill in your office, I had to put one in my lab, by the way, because uh, I've seen them. They're very cool. I would just as soon IV a Big Mac than live. Yeah, so the hypocrisy meter is going to go off very quickly if I didn't. And I write, write about that in the book. It's actually just right over there. I will put a, my laptop on there when I am busy having to write or something like that and just walk about 1.82 miles an hour. I get a full-blown aerobic workout every day simply by integrating it into my life. No, that's fantastic. So the first, so the first suggestion is just do it. Yeah. Okay. So, your, so exercise is, is number one rule. Number, what? number two, well, it's not number two, but the second one you were going to mention was stress. Yes, and it's because they're related. The question you can ask is, when you get to a certain age, what stressors begin to apply to you that may not have applied to you when you were younger? Some stresses go away, some come back. But as you get older, it's sad you start going to as many funerals as weddings. You start understanding that some of your bodily functions aren't working very well, and they're probably going to get 
less well as you get older and you can't stop them. You can only slow down the erosion. If you feel like you're no, you might walk down to the basement and forget why you were there. And immediately you're starting to think, I got Alzheimer's. You have tremendous amounts of stress in this age group that is unique to the age group. So the question you can ask is, and the brain rule is very simple, stressed brains don't learn the same way as non-stressed brains. So perhaps I can talk about some bad news first. Okay. And then I'd like to talk about some good news because like there's plenty of good news to be had. And I'm 57 and I've never felt more alive in my life. So, Well, well just, to, just to interrupt you and say that, that's exactly the case with the women in our community. And I think that this is so unique about our, our generation is we're doing this for the first time. There's never been a generation of women in their 60s who are so healthy and so active and and so we are kind of experiencing this for the first time. And um, sure. talking about stress, I mean, I totally agree with you. Um, the financial situation, for example, that a lot of women found themselves in, in, you know, 2008 and after, it's just their pensions have gone and, and, and there's a whole multiple layers now of stress. So I think it's, sure. it's really great to highlight this one. So I'm, I'm, please continue. Absolutely. And it's particularly relevant on this side of the pond because we're still grappling with health insurance issues. Yeah. And so being able to work with catastrophic illnesses, which is much more prevalent in our age group, yes, um, yeah. is a big deal. Yeah, so, sure. yeah. so let's get into it. Yeah, let's talk okay. about stress. stress. Okay. Here's the thing. It's actually not the stress or the presence of stress that actually hurts you. The brain rule is stress brains don't learn the same way as non-stress brains, but the, uh, but the antecedent is stress brains don't learn at all. So the question you can ask is, what about stress? The research is clear. It's not the presence of an aversive stimulus, a stressful stimulus, that causes the bad stuff to occur. It's your perception of feeling in control or not over the bad stuff that really produces the type of stress that can hurt learning. The more out of control you feel over the aversive stuff coming at you, out of control measured in two dimensions. Number one, you can't control the severity of the, of, the, of the bad guy knocking on your door, and you can't control the frequency of the knocks. When those two you can no longer control, then you have the type of stress that actually hurts brain function. When you get older and your spinal column doesn't work as well anymore, and you go to the doctor, and it's just never going to be the same, you are out of control. So that's the bad news. Right. So, so quickly, question though. How, so, how does that affect your brain? I mean, how, I mean, what does it actually do to your brain? Sure. Well, we actually know, or at least we think we do. <laughs> there is a, uh, a. Have you heard of the region of the brain called the hippocampus before? Have you heard I've that? Heard of that region? Yeah. Yeah. It literally means. I don't know where seals. it is, but. <laughs> it's right in the center of your brain. You've got. To... <laughs> in fact, you can think of if you want this part of a larger structure called the limbic structure in the brain, which you can sort of think of as a. Forgive me a scorpion right in the middle of your brain, okay? okay? The claws of the scorpion are regions we call the amygdala, which are responsible for emotional processing. And you've got two of them on either side. Connecting the claws to the body are the legs of a scorpion. Those legs, that's the hippocampi, and you have two of them. Okay. So the two hips, right in the center of your brain, if that makes sense, that's where we're going to be talking about for a second. Okay. When you are stressed, you can produce a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol, though, is your, is your uh, uh, archetypal, very powerful stress hormone. Okay. When you feel stress, your kidneys just dump all kinds of cortisol into your bloodstream. And part of those, some of that cortisol goes right into the hippocampus and takes pot shots at the nerves there and kills them. Wow. Does not allow them to function. So quite literally, cortisol can kill brain cells. And that's the answer to your question for you were asking how that works. Wow. I mean, so yep. that's pretty serious. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a physical reality that is that stress is, is creating. And that's, you know, not just losing your memory, but that's actually damaging your brain. Right. Well, the hippocampus is involved in the conversion of yeah. many things yeah. involved in learning. The biggest is the conversion from short-term memory to long-term memory. So when you're stressed, you don't memorize very well. That's true even in younger populations. You can see this with severe trauma, where you can actually get both what's called an anterograde and retrograde amnesia. The chauffeur that was driving Princess Diana on the night of the wreck, to this day, cannot remember what happened three hours before and three hours after the wreck. So you're, with, with severe stress, you have lots of cognitive collapse. Um, memory goes, problem solving goes, impulse control goes, Here's the biggie, Margaret. Executive function goes. Wow. 
news, you lose which gives us a conduit to some really good news. So this actually leads into another question, and I will come back to the third in a minute. But the sure. question about memory is really important to this age group because sure. you, you described earlier about going into a room and like, what, what am I doing here? What, have I, what did I come yeah. for? <laughs> so well, like, is, is memory loss at, 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 at any level a natural progression of aging? Can we, can we just expect that as we get older, whether we're not stressed or whether we exercise a lot, that still we're going to lose our memory as we get older a little bit? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, that's encouraging. So, I'm glad so I asked. So I'm almost dying, Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, how do, so then the question is, how do we deal with forgetfulness, which is everybody does that. You know, you forget your glasses on your head or you put them at keys in the fridge. How do you just not worry about that as opposed to a, a mental illness, or not a mental illness, but a memory illness that you know, I like Alzheimer's, for example? Uh, sure. Well, let's, uh, let's be clear. It, do, you, it, it does erode. But you can slow down the rate of effacement. That there is no question. You can slow it down so imperceptibly that it doesn't feel like you're aging at all. So let's unpack it a little bit. Okay. In the book, I describe the fact that there's probably 30 or 40 different memory gadgets in the brain. They all work in a semi-independent fashion, and they all process different things. For example, if I remember that the Battle of Hastings occurred in 1066, that's a declarative piece of information, okay? Declarative information, things you can declare. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is the third president of the United States of America. The capital of Zimbabwe is. All those are things you can declare. That's declarative memory. Here's another type of memory that is not declarative. Margaret and John are having a conversation. That's what we call an episode. This is episodic memory. Episodic memory does not involve the Battle of Hastings. Episodic memory involves the here and the now, and it is an episode with a timestamp, characters that move through that timestamp, and something that is happening to it. Interestingly enough, aging afflicts different types of memory systems differently. In part, we think it's genetic, so some people just have, get more nicks in one area than another. For some people, their declarative memory is shot. They forget the names of people. They forget the names of Diana Spence, Diana, Diana, Diana Windsor. Uh, you know, I, I don't get that anymore. They forget. And yet at the same time, can remember beautifully. Who gave their little girl red shoes when that little girl was three years old? Well, being able to have somebody's name in hand is declarative. Being able to understand who gave somebody a present is episodic. So it's very uneven and... Um, yeah, so that's probably the best thing to think. That's really interesting. So, I mean, these, all these rules are so applicable, but if you were to rewrite the book today and you were going to write it, you know, the um, brain rules for the aging brain, uh -huh, is, is sure. there anything that, there's an idea for you, um, is there anything <laughs> that you would add or anything that you would put more emphasis on or that you would adjust? And what made me think of that question was sleep. Because uh, one yeah. of your rules is, um, is sleep, that the brain needs sleep in order to think. But I, had, I know from my experience, as an, getting older, that I sleep less every night. And I don't miss my sleep. I, I've, you know, five hours, I'm wide awake, active, busy. Yep. So, so, is, so the question is, would you emphasize any of your rules for the older brain? Um, and, you know, would you add any? Would you, you know, would you put some more in? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the clearest, I probably would add one more, and that has to do, you could actually call it the power of nostalgia. Okay. <laughs> the ability of your past experiences to influence present cognitive competence, if that okay. makes sense. No, it does. It's extraordinary what it does. We can add sleep to that, too. Sleep, past the age of 40, sleep really gets deregulated. Some people can soar through their sleep cycles till they're dead and all as well. Uh, mm -hmm. For some people, have always had a problem with sleep. And as they get older, they have more of a problem with sleep. It's so uneven that right now, I don't think you can responsibly make a projection that says, as, that, as you age, this happens to your sleep cycle. We just are not quite sure. We do know that certain amounts of stress uh, um, can change the sleep cycle. And with aging populations, it's much worse than with younger populations because mm -hmm. they're not as resilient, for sure. Okay. But let's talk about something that is wonderful. We'll get to the good news about okay. the stress in a, in a minute, too. But oh, I do want to hear that. let's talk about nostalgia <laughs> and the ability to. Oh, you've got to see this YouTube sometime. This is amazing. There is this guy in a wheelchair 
African-American gentleman. He's right in the middle of a nursing home and he is in his 80s and he's curled up like a pretzel. He's dying. At least he looks like he's dying. He's not. He's got a lively brain, but we don't know that yet. We're about to. What happens to him is that he's got a loving daughter. It's just the sweetest woman. Comes up to him and knows that this guy loves Cab Calloway, a musician he grew up with, mm -hmm. a nostalgia. That's where we're headed here. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so what she's done is she's taken an iPod and just filled it with all of Cab Calloway's greatest hits. And he puts, she puts the earpiece in his ears, old man like this, turns it on, and you watch something that is the closest to a resurrection you are ever wow. going to get. Margaret, it'll send chills up your spine. This, the guy opens up like a flower and he begins to smile and he stops these repetitive behaviors and he starts singing <laughs> and he sings Cab Calloway. And then he looks directly at, I think it's the camera or maybe his daughter's behind a filming or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then just starts saying, don't you love music? Is it music? Music just makes the whole, and he starts going on and on. And you see inside that shriveled intellect, was a dynamo. It just needed to come out with the memories of nostalgia. It is now becoming increasingly clear that if you are older, if you can begin filling your world with things from yesteryear, you can have, I'll just call it the Cab Calloway uh, syndrome without giving it a, without any, any, anything more formal, and we even think we know why. Would you like to know the mechanism of why nostalgia works? So the practical suggestion yes. is fill your house with what you used to love. Fill it with posters of things you used to see. Reread old books. You want new ones too, for sure. But get the sounds, the smells. Go back and revisit what you were eating before and get that on a regular diet. This is such good news, isn't it? I mean, it's such but a this cool is, thing to And the, to and the reason that it's so cool, just to say, and I want you to hold that thought, though, is because in our community, we do, I do this all the time. I post things like, you know, just a memory, like, you know, what, what, what was your favorite record? If you could describe your life with a song, what would it be? And the conversations that we get on Facebook are unbelievable. I mean, we get people, talk, yeah. it, it resurrects a memory. Um, I remember telling people about a, a picture with my brothers, and I put it on, on uh, YouTube, on um, the post, and it had a picture of a coat. I was wearing this old coat and everybody said, yeah. oh my God, I had that coat from Sears Roebuck. And it was just like that everyone could remember their moms ordering this silly coat. But right. you're right, memories are so powerful and they energize you. You know, they make you feel positive. And that is good news. Was there more good news? <laughs> well, there is. But we should probably discuss the mechanism of it because this Please. is not an opinion. Okay. This is straight up brain science. I would call it psychological science here, but it's increasingly... It's understood in my world, and we should explain the mechanism. Okay. It's hysterical. It, there is something that's called, well, we're going to hit two of these, context-specific learning and state-specific learning. They're very much the same, similar ideas. We'll go through each. Okay. Context-specific learning is this. If I put a diver's mask on you, Margaret, okay, I'm going to put a diver's mask on you, and then I'm going to give you a list of 14 words, and I want you to memorize those words. Okay, so you're going to memorize those words. Two days later, I'm going to come back to you. If I've, I'm going to ask you to retrieve those 14 words, okay? Remember as many of them as you can, Margaret. Go ahead. Okay. And what I'll do is that I will either put a dive, that diver's mask, the same one, back on you or not. If I put the diver's mask on you, your score goes up 20%, sometimes 40 depending upon the study. Your brain, it turns out, is busy recording all of the environmental information in addition to the task that you're moving on and is remembering it. Mm -hmm. And if you can reproduce at the moment of retrieval those same conditions that occur during the moment of what we call encoding, that's when I first asked you to memorize it, mm -hmm. and if, if those two are equal, your memory scores are better. Do you see where I'm headed with this? I do. Well, sort of. And, and, and I have to do with also with scent, like association of scent with memories as well. But anyway, this is sure. very interesting. Yeah. That's called context-specific learning. Yes, the more you can reproduce right. the familiar, the better your brain gets. And here's how we think what happens is this. When you're filling your room with nostalgia, you get those, we call them dopamine lollipops. You get this specialized, wonderful feeling about you. Your brain also gets a little better. And we're thinking maybe that you're feeling that, you're sensing that something is coming back online. So that's the first. 
I did also mention something else called state-specific learning, and this is what's hysterical, because this was done with marijuana. <laughs> not known for a, a drug that's not known for improving your memory. But the question was asked was, if the context is really, really good, the outer, what about the inner life? What about, let's make you high, we'll get you a joint, and then I'm going to give you that list of 14 words. And I'm going to have you memorize them. Two days later, I'm going to come back again, Margaret, just like I'd done before. Instead of giving you a diver's mask, I'm giving you a joint. I want you to smoke it. Your memory score, I'm not making this up, is better when you're high than if you're not. Because you are matching the conditions of retrieval, now internal, which is why this is called state-specific. So you you're in a high, state. But do you have to be high when you're remembering as well? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I <don't laughs> know. This is the experiment. The, you're high when you learned it, high when you're retrieving it, and your score is better as if I didn't, as, <laughs> if I didn't give you the joint, it wouldn't work as well. Also, it's better if I make you happy. Let's say if you see a movie that's happy, and then I give you the list of words, and at retrieval you see the movie again, and you're happy. If I make you sad, oddly enough, show you a movie like the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan, and maybe you're scared, uh, 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 and then you at retrieval, we do it again. So the more you can mimic the conditions of initial encoding, and if you are 60 years old, you have a lifetime of mood. You have a lifetime of context. You have a lifetime of nostalgia. You see where I'm headed now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you can reproduce that, the better it is. And that's something you can show. So another practical suggestion, really if I were to write cool. a book specifically for this age group, which was your question, mm -hmm. I would say the first thing you do is recreate your childhood. Go ahead and have a great time. In fact, recreate a lot of your life right in your room. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting because um, a lot of people are thinking about, uh, you know, apprehension about death and about the, the fact they were going to die. And one of the things that's becoming very popular is this, uh, this planning, your, planning your funeral or planning what's going to happen. And, I, and one of the things that's always suggested is that you tell your story. And, I, and that's what you've just described. I think that's a really cool. I think you should write this book. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be really, really cool. Well, the interesting thing about, I, I, I probably will at some point, and it's because uh, as the baby boomers get older in the yeah. United States, and we're still the biggest demographic, Absolutely. I mean, we just are, there is tons of research money being thrown at it because scientists are getting older too. Well, I think you should make it your 60th year birthday gift to yourself to have this, this book come out. But, so I have a couple of more questions for you. And um, just in terms of personal things, I mean, how has this work um, changed you and affected you as an individual? What, what has it made you feel about the future and about, about the science of brain work? Do you mean uh, writing the book Brain Rules or my career? What, no, just uh, you personally, you as an individual. How, how, has it made you feel more hopeful, more, um, you know, more, um, I, I don't know, confused, more, <laughs> you know, I mean, just because just, sure. I mean, working with this every day. And what I must love, I must say, I love about your work is that it's very grounded in reality. Like you don't accept anything that's not um, provable. And right. so you're, you're a seeker of truth, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. That's, that probably at times can be quite challenging. So I just yeah. wondered how it's affected you, John, as a, as a human being with your, in your relationships, your family, your, your life. It's made me younger. Yes. Like that, that is the way to say it, to answer the question. When the, the brain is naturally good at hypothesis testing anyway. In fact, we're born with it. The, uh, uh, Andy Meltzoff wrote a book called, and Pat, Patricia Kuhl, or her, um, his, his um, wife, wrote a book called Scientist mm -hmm. in the Crib. Okay. It's a great read, you ought to get it, because it talks about what a baby can do. What a baby can do is hypothesis test, learns through a series of increasingly corrected ideas. And if you stay in a profession that's like that, where you're constantly hungry and you're constantly learning, I tell you, here's an interesting statistic that I just, it just blows my mind. I've known about it for years. There is 1.8 meters of DNA in a typical nerve cell nucleus which is measured in microns. That's like taking 60 kilometers of your favorite fishing line and stuffing it into a cherry pit. That's incredible. And you know, yeah. it's not just stuffed into that cherry pit. It is folded into that cherry pit like a beautiful tapestry. Folding is so important the three-dimensional configuration of, a, of, of DNA in a nucleus. Folding is so important if you fold it one way, you'll get a nerve cell. Fold it another way, you can get a muscle cell. Fold it another way, you can get a fat cell. I just, I'm sorry. That just jazzes me. And it makes <laughs> yeah. me feel younger. 
And every time I open up, I look at a microscope, you know, microscopes, microscopes to me is an electron microscopes and gel shift assays and all the things I do, PCR, feels like a song, not a technology. Well, you have just described something that is very near and dear to my heart, which is this fusion of art and science. That wherever you have, wherever you dig deep enough into science, you find just this majestic beauty. And that, like you said, a psalm, it's just amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. And, it, and you beam it, you live it. So it's great. So we've covered, um, I think, the priorities in your book. But I would encourage everybody to read the whole thing. And you've got it on tape. Um, do you want to tell us a little about your website? Because I, you've got a fantastic website. Sure. Lots of resources. Well, well, I owe that a lot to my publisher. It was my publisher's idea to put oh, the, the website together. Um, yes, what we've got there is that we've got all 12 of the brain rules listed. There's animations. I actually bring up some of the primary research itself, and you can click on the graphs. And if you've forgotten what a standard deviation is, or if you've never known what an effect size is, you can click on there. So there's little statistics lessons. There's also the references. So if you're interested in looking at for yourself a little deeper at some of the things I mentioned in the book, we kept the references out of the book, mostly because we wanted to keep it as friendly as we could. But the website is both is meant to be both a summary of everything that's in there and a reference if you wanted to dig further. And there's a couple of, I think there's 12 videos of me interacting and kind of being, I'm a Monty Python freak. And so <laughs> we did our best to have a little bit of that in there. You too. know, <laughs> you did better than John Cleese. The, uh, and uh, we didn't talk about That is it. high praise, Mark, because I love John Cleese. I love, I love the one you did with the, the, the kid's brain uh, in the classroom and the kid's brain Wait, in the I'm playground. <laughs> It's great, but you're right. It's just those anti-brain environments that we work in and that you, the kids go to school in. That's a whole other – we should do that on another night because it's a whole other topic, isn't it, about education and oh, gosh, changes yeah. we could And make. a whole other topic about in the business world for those yeah. people that are in, uh, in a recession, you're going to have to do thousands of more things than you right. used to have to do and no, no, nobody to help you. Talk about a stressor. Yeah. So what's the one big question that you're still trying to figure out? What's, what, what's, what's moving you on every day? Well, well, one of the biggest that I contemplate a lot is we used to think that the human brain when you were born was a tabula rasa, that you just had this blank slate and could do anything you want. That was <laughs> done by a bunch of underfunded psychology professors <laughs> who never had any kids. Because as soon as you have children, the first thing you realize is that they come with all kinds of preloaded software. There. That's what gets me. I want to know what that preloaded software is. I want to know what happens when it screws up and you can get a depression or an anxiety disorder or schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. that, my thing is psychiatric disorders. But what really jazzes me is that you've got preloaded software at all. And I would just love to know the cells, the genes, and the uh, circuitry behind it. Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's a fantastic. Well, I hope that you figure it out. And when you do get the answer to that one, let me know. And we'll have you come back on and tell us what it is. <laughs> I'm it's, delightful to chat with you, Margaret. It has been brilliant. Thank you so much for being here with us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Take good care. Bye-bye.